Good afternoon and welcome to section 8 of this conference. The contribution of basic sciences to advanced education. In the first part of this section, we have four speakers, two more will join us, one online, who between them cover the basic sciences, different geographies, and a variety of approaches by which science is contributing to advanced education. Our first speaker is Dr. Anjum Halai, Vice Provost and Dean, Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Aga Khan University in Karachi, Pakistan. She is the Vice President of the International Commission of Mathematical Instruction. Dr. Hala, you have uh, 15 minutes and I'll ring the bell at the end of 10, so you have an Thank idea. You. Is, this is this working? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum and good, good day. I was about to say good morning, but it's already good afternoon. It is really a great pleasure for me to be speaking here at this um, conference on basic sciences and sustainable development. Thank you very much for the privilege and the invitation and the opportunity. As Shanani pointed out, I come from the Aga Khan University in Karachi, Pakistan, but my university has campuses in six countries. Uh, Outside Pakistan, we have a campus in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and also in the UK. So I bring those experiences because I have also worked for a long time in East Africa. In this paper, I will focus on goal four of the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 goals, all of them, one way or the other, connected to basic sciences. And I will look at goal four, which states, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. That's the goal four. And uh, I will uh, draw upon the case of the capacity and network project of the ICMI, the International Commission for Mathematical Instruction. The ICMI is active, was founded in 1908 and is a commission of International Mathematics Union. So I will draw on that case study. But before I go to the case, uh, I will provide a brief overview of the global education context. There are about 262 million children and youth out of school. And of those who are in school, 58% of children and adolescents are not achieving minimum proficiency levels in reading and mathematics. UNESCO's report from the International Task Force for Teachers for Education 2030, and this report is available on the, uh, on the UNESCO website, International Task Force for Teachers for Education 2030, notes with specific reference to Sub-Saharan Africa. We heard that Africa is the fastest growing province, the youngest province in terms of the profile of its education. And, the, and one result of that is that um, the education infrastructure needs to expand very rapidly. A consequence of that is, according to the report, this report by UNESCO, that to reach the Education 2030 goals, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa will need to recruit 15 million teachers by 2030. The proportion currently of qualified teachers in the region has steadily declined since 2000 at both primary and secondary levels. And the ratio of pupils to trained teachers remains, um, uh, you know, uh, low in the sense that there are 58 pupils per trained teacher at primary and 43 pupils per trained teacher at secondary levels. Female teachers, there's a lot of research to show that female teachers play a role model in encouraging girls' enrollment but fewer than 50% of teachers are female at primary level and falling to less than 30% at secondary level. And these countries need external financial support to fund essential non-salary costs in, and including initial teacher education and continuing teacher professional development. If you look at, uh, we focus Within the general education framework, if you focus on STEM education, then the, the situation is that the pre-service and in-service teacher preparation in STEM and computer studies is very weak. 
and it's sporadic depending on the funding available from external sources because these are um, there is the internally there is no systemic infrastructure for uh, in service uh, teacher professional development another issue uh, is that very often teacher development is regarded as workshops and these workshops are determined, the topics of the workshops are determined externally and they are top down and do not build on the agency, autonomy and professionalism of the teachers. And I would add that this, uh, this problem, although I, I quoted the UNESCO's report from sub-Saharan African context, because that's, that's where the, that's the fastest growing uh, school age population, but this problem is not limited to that region. It, expa it, it extends to other low and middle income country contexts where government spending is low and education infrastructure is increasing um, uh, rapidly. In this context of a problem, there is uh, the professional learning networks are being proposed and there is significant evidence for that. I have it on my, um, I can refer to that, those studies that professional learning networks offer new spaces in which teachers may learn and grow as professionals. These networks provide opportunity to the teachers to expand their web of connections beyond the face-to-face, -face, particularly now when the digital infrastructure in the post-COVID environment has expanded very rapidly. And it is in this, um, the capacity and network project of the ICMAI also creates such networks, mainly in low and middle income countries. But the difference is that these, the capacity and network project focuses on mathematics teachers and, and their uh, mathematics teachers at all levels. And it, it aims to develop the educational capacity of those responsible for mathematics teachers. So for example, teacher education departments, they are the local ministry uh, officials, and, if, and create sustained and effective regional networks include, which reach out to mathematics educators, but also importantly to mathematicians. T typically, educators and the subject experts in, even in university departments, very often work in silos, but this is what the Capacity and Network Project aims to do, bring them together. To date, ICMAI has led five Capacity and Network Projects. The first one held in Mali in September 2011. Mali is in Francophone Sub-Saharan African region. Second one was held in Costa Rica in August 2012. Um, in the Caribbean and Central American region. The third one held in Cambodia in 2013 in Southeast Asia. The fourth one where I was personally involved because I was working in that part of the world at the time in Tanzania in East Africa in September 2014. And the fifth one held in Lima, Peru in the Andean region in 2016. You will see from this geographical spread that most of the countries, if not all of them, are low and middle income countries, and they are largely outside the Euro-Western world. And the reason is that in the Euro-Western world, the tradition of mathematics education research is relatively well established. These camp regions, uh, these camps were initiated, and, but at, at this point in time, as I speak, we, uh, ICMAI is not going to hold more camps, but we are looking at in-depth sustainability of these five camps. Uh, camps bring together, so how are camps identified the regions? The need is expressed by the local education community, but at least in one case, the executive committee of ICMAI identified a gap in the education um, community in the East African region and took the initiative to have set up the capacity and network project over there. I sometimes refer to the short form capacity and network project as CAMP, so apologies if I didn't explain it. The important part of the capacity and network project, as I mentioned earlier, is that it brings mathematicians and mathematics educators together. And these five projects today are a significant resource. They are a significant resource because working at the grassroots level, they provide insights into key issues and challenges in supporting mathematics education uh, at, at the level of the school uh, and classrooms. 
and by sharing the, the learnings these, uh, in cross-national regional formats, they also provide an opportunity uh, to understand the lessons learned so that a pro we can promote inclusive and quality education in mathematics classrooms. For example, in the capacity and network project in Tanzania, how did we, what was the process? So it was carried out in 2014 and the work continues to date, but when it was initiated, a needs analysis was carried out. What were the needs that the teachers felt? And as I had explained before, that one of the issues is the under-preparedness of the teachers. So the teachers themselves provided a list of topics where they would like support. Algebra and functions, trigonometry, these were some of the topics that they really wanted support in. And, we, uh, and somebody who's familiar, very familiar with the school mathematics curriculum know, uh, would understand that traditionally the primary school curriculum focuses on number, number theory, number operations, number relations, and higher uh, level topics like algebra, functions, trigonometry come much later. So there is under preparedness for teachers and that's what they express the needs. Expert and knowledgeable mathematicians were sponsored by ICMAI and they content, um, conducted intensive two, day, uh, two weeks workshop with key stakeholders in the region. Who were the key stakeholders? These would be heads of the mathematics departments in the local institutions or teacher educators, colleague, professionals who would be expected to mentor and provide further guidance to the teachers on the ground. The, net, the, the network, the capacity and network project now is uh, owned by the local community, the local institutions, and events are held regularly. So in March, for example, the Pi Day is celebrated by the mathematics community, and that's a regular feature where teachers come together for their capacity development. ICMAI also supports the local experts to become part of the global community by sponsoring their partnership in global events, such as uh, in, the, in July this year, in Shanghai, there was the International Congress for Mathematics Educators, and their registration fee of the participants of the networks was, uh, it was a virtual event, and ICMAI supported participation by, uh, by paying, by sponsoring their registration fee. Next year, in February, there, is, there will be an in-person meeting of the five uh, network projects and their leaders. And I, I, I should have mentioned that each network project has a coordinator in the executive committee of ICMAI. So the, the interaction between ICMAI and the local network continues and the interaction so that the local um, community can draw the expertise from the well-resourced community in the, in the Euro-Western world and other parts of the region can then be facilitated through ICMAI. The five capacity and network projects today um, are a rich resource uh, and they have led to connectivity between the mathematics education community and mathematicians um, today and in the increasingly digital and digitally connected world, th they provide an inclusivity so that knowledge from the well-resourced uh, centers is flowing to those centers where knowledge is not uh, so easily available. It is all, the network also provides opportunity for those teachers and those educators who are otherwise left out of the circuit of capacity development initiatives. Particularly now we are supporting access uh, and holding regular, uh, regular meetings of the capacity and network project participants through the uh, digital forums. So that is something uh, very valuable that is happening, uh, outreach to the grassroots level. The other thing is that the capacity and network projects activities continue during the course of the year. They are not sporadic. Of course, the international events such as conferences 
and such as meetings sponsored by ICMAI provide the focal points, but they otherwise continue throughout the year. They are iterative in nature and therefore respond to the complexities of the teaching practice as, as the needs evolve. And therefore, I, I, I think that this, uh, the capacity and network projects pro as a flagship event or pro program of the ICMAI offers really a good way forward for ensuring inclusion and equity and bringing up the bar of quality of mathematics teaching by enhancing the capacity of the teachers. And we know, we recognize all of us that the teacher is the single most crucial element which determines quality at the level of the schools and classrooms. Thank you very much. You have another final the UNESCO. I had, I had received so many warnings about the bell ringing oh, that no. I finished my, my presentation in time. The UNESCO report, uh, Education Counts, it states that uh, if all students in low-income countries leave school with basic reading skills, there will be a 12% cut in world poverty. If in addition to this, their arithmetic skills are improved with programs such as the Capacity and Network Project, how much greater would be the impact on poverty alleviation and, and human well-being in general? Now, from mathematics, we move to physics education, research, and collaboration at the global level. The second panelist is Dr. Sasha Smelling, Head, Teacher and Student Programs at CERN. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation. It's a real honor to uh, show you here what we are doing in education, but also to give some hints about the, the thinking of uh, education for peace and a sustainable future. So CERN was created uh, in 1954, and you, you saw the, the presentation already yesterday about CERN. It's an international organization which built a laboratory in Geneva, and the, the numbers you see here, they are for the laboratory. Now, CERN at its outset already was clearly an organization which was done for peace. It was doing nuclear research, what was called nuclear research at the time, under the umbrella of civil research of peace. And uh, so essentially, we are already on this goal number 16, and I'm trying to map the goals a bit here. Of course, CERN is a collaboration in itself, in its statutes, so also the, the goals four for education, 17 for collaboration, and nine for innovation were already there at that beginning of the organization. Now, in the recent years, since the emergence of the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, we also subscribe to the other goals, to gender equality and uh, also to, uh, to clean, green energy, which we are pursuing in, in some of our projects. Now, the mission of CERN essentially is fourfold, and uh, I put here already the signature page, and Probably those of you from those 12 countries, at that point in time, it was Yugoslavia, still one of our founding member states. Uh, you maybe find the signature of an eminent scientist from your country there, and you see the discussions in 1952 at UNESCO, and that was our celebration of the 60th anniversary there. All of this is to support the mission of CERN, which is fourfold. Fundamental research first and foremost, innovative, technologies in order to get this fundamental research done, the collaboration for the good of humanity, and the education and inspiration of future scientists. So this you can immediately map, except fundamental research, which is just the basis of everything here, to the goals of, for sustainable development. CERN is a laboratory for the world, and uh, CERN has a lot of people on site every day that work on societal topics, on physics topics. 
And uh, you can see we are still far from gender equality. We are at currently about 23% uh, women in research at CERN. And uh, we also have our goals in order to, uh, to get this number up. Now, coming to the point, education, as I'm not going to talk about particle physics here, but about education, let me just look into what CERN conventionally thinks about education. So there is training opportunities for students. We call them administrative, technical or doctoral students. There is a lot of programs for fellows with some very interesting names, which we just started. We have a summer student program. And you see, we do a lot of training for young scientists. Also, CERN is running lots of schools for scientists. Schools about physics, about computing, about instrumentation, about accelerators. But my question here is a different one. My question is, is that education? And uh, you will relatively soon see that I think education is more than that, more than training. So this quote here, I took it out of a book of 1910, actually is a quote from uh, 1886 from Ernst Mach. And he essentially formulated what I think is what we need to educate on. So he formulated essentially what is the nature of science. And this is, to my understanding, what we need to educate, not only our specific branches that we have, but the nature of science, the science for, us, for all of us in order to be on a sustainable path. Now, the question is, of course, whom do we want to reach? And whom do we want to educate? And the answer is quite simple. The answer is we need to educate everyone. Now, we cannot reach everyone. That's, of course, impossible. So how do we do this? We do this by educating through multipliers. But who are those multipliers? Are those teachers? That's one of the uh, standard approaches, I would say. I'll come to this in a second. Can we go through students? But what are students? You have seen in my title, I'm head of teacher and student programs. But for me, students start at age five. So my mandate really starts at age five, is a bit interrupted at the age when our HR department is interested in people, and then goes on for the general public. So which age are those students? So what I'm going to show you here is how CERN handles things. And at the end, I will draw some conclusions and uh, give some ideas for discussion. So I said we start with everyone. Now, what you of course can do is you can just invite everyone. But inviting everyone means you have to have people that can travel there. You have to have also a large offer. And actually, if you want to invite everyone, not everybody is interested to come for some time to CERN. So you have to make this attractive and you can reduce it to a visit. So one way to do this, to really invite everyone, is to build a science center, like we are just doing, and whoever tries to move between France and Switzerland sees the construction site quite far, and next year we'll, we'll inaugurate it. And uh, the part that I'm part of in there is mainly the education labs, the education facilities in there, and I also put the large auditorium there because for me, science and education are communication, communication between people. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a press officer and I never wanted to be and I will never be one. But communication between people, to my understanding, is one of the, the main topics that we need to focus on. So I put the auditorium because one part of my team is working largely on science shows how to show science in an entertaining fashion, how to get people motivated and curious about science. Now, let me just go back to the uh, 
Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot one. We, we have currently already one lab, one school lab. Unfortunately, that needs to uh, give way to the science gateway, so we'll close this in six weeks from now. But as you can see, this is, is not a photo where we put uh, actors there. This is a school group coming into it after about 10 minutes and building their own experiments. So those people came in and it, a school group usually is a group which is quite heterogeneous. There is about, say, out of the 30, there are five that are interested, 10 that you draw with you and 15 whom you have to motivate to uh, already sit down. So the question is, how do you motivate them to be that active as this group? Now, let me come back to the multiplier part. And this multiplier part, the teachers, we try since 1998. We have teacher programs. As you can see, we had about 15,000 teachers by now passing through the CERN teacher programs. And this is the teachers that passed through the teacher programs on site. Since the pandemic, we also do online teacher programs and uh, we, we reached about 3,000 teachers during the years of the pandemic. Now you can say, okay, lots of teachers, that multiplies to about 100 to 200 students that might be interested through those teachers. We have again put that a bit on another scale and you see this uh, this uh, collection of flags here, which is the Southeast Asia Science Education Program, which we started in 2019 in uh, New Delhi. In 2020, it should have happened in Bhutan, uh, couldn't happen because of the uh, pandemic, but we are going to go through those eight countries depicted here uh, and do programs there with about uh, 500 teachers each. So there's a lot of, lot of teachers you, you can reach but you can only tell the teachers a bit about what is science, what is physics. You also have to support them and uh, you also have to, uh, to see how they can get to the students. That's by the way why most of our teacher programs are in the languages of the different countries. And I'm also coming to this later again because one of the problems we have on education on international scale is that education is very, very, very cultural. If you look at only the 23 member states of CERN, you find a three-digit number of high school physics curricula. You can multiply this with biology, chemistry, earth sciences and so on, and we are in the thousands already. And 23 countries is not a lot compared to 194, I think is the current count of the UN. Now, I said multipliers is one approach. Now, we can go also to students. Now, you can invite students, and uh, we did an educational internship program as a pilot for the moment, 500 high school students aged 16 to 19 from our member states came to CERN and uh, this pilot has just finished in the May, in the month of May of this year and we are looking into continuing this. But again, it's people coming to CERN. Now how can you get that bigger? One possibility is you make a competition and uh, we have a quite um, successful competition called Beamline for Schools and this Beamline for Schools competition in fact is um, a competition where about 300 teams of high school students of the age between 14 to 19 from all over the world take part. You see the uh, countries that have taken part over the last years, the number of teams. And uh, in each team there is around 15 to 20 students. So you can multiply the number of teams by this number of students that we have activated worldwide, they have worked for one year on one physics experiment, like a scientist would do about 20 years later in their lives. And uh, the current winners, a team from Egypt and a team from uh, Spain have just arrived at CERN. They will run their experiment uh, in these two weeks. And I'm really happy to see them tomorrow night when I, when I come back to CERN because it's always the motivation to really see students in work. But again, 
we are only talking about people who can come to CERN. What about those who cannot come? Now, the pandemic, we could also take as an opportunity. Because you can imagine, I have a team of, in total, 15 people, out of which nine are students. Um, we just have time to run our programs normally. During the pandemic, with nobody on site, we could make a virtual program too. So we have virtual science shows and alone in the first year of the pandemic, we reached 15,000 students that uh, came to our virtual science shows. Now, virtual science shows are a good thing to reach a lot of students, but if it's just a video, you will not reach them for that much time that a science show takes. So you have to do it interactively. Works fine, but also is limited. Now, I talked about going to the students. So one way is you create games. And uh, all the things that you see here, I call it low cost material for the classroom because either you just need a normal printer or you need a 3D printer to make all of those experiments. That goes from a laser setup with which you can do uh, uh, even a Michelson interferometer by just 3D printing. Okay, the laser you cannot yet 3D print, but uh, we will see that might come at some point. All the experiments that you can see here from that, from a linear accelerator to a particle trap, to, to models of what science is, none of this costs more than around $20, even with the additional material. And we have quite a lot of feedback on this. This is something to support teachers, but also students can uh, also print them themselves and, and work with them. So that's on the support side. Something very new, actually it started on Tuesday, is the CERN Solvay Education Program. So what I did was, together with, uh, with my team, we found a YouTuber, somebody with a few hundred K subscribers on YouTube, who uh, joined our team in this program, and who is going to produce short videos, explainer videos, and we'll have an international student camp of those students who finished the quizzes after the explainer video. And uh, this program, as I said, started on Tuesday. And uh, I just, as I have a minute left, will show you one of the first videos. The format is portrait because we identified that YouTube is not the right channel today to get students at that age. It's TikTok. So all the videos that we produce will be TikTok videos. And uh, I only got a very, very short notice uh, from this first video, which on the two first days had already more than 50,000 clicks. So uh, these explainer videos, um, I spare you the music in the background because this is really made for teenagers. Um, there is no text spoken. And uh, you can see there is a full explanation of an experiment first which you can reproduce at home. This one is quite complex already. Five more minutes. I need three. Um, and this, um, um, these videos show first what's the physical principle and how can you reproduce it, and then it shows how it is used in our scientific installations. The idea is to have two of those short videos per month over the next three years and to have at least one explainer video per month. And in the end, there will be a um, competition so that these summer camps, there will be also three camps in the three years, will then be uh, filled with young learners who, uh, who followed the courses. Okay, I think I ha don't let you watch the, the full video. You can do that on the web all the time if you want. There is, that's the first video. The second will go online next Monday. And uh, um, actually, this is a preview of the one of next Monday. I didn't show you the one which came out first. 
Yeah, so that's an education program. Now, we are talking all the time about uh, scientific basis for, for education. All of the programs I showed you are empirically evaluated. They are based on a principle which in social sciences is called design-based research. So um, this design-based research means you make a proposal how to teach something, you build it, you test it with students, you test it with teachers. We do this with all our facilities, with all our materials and all our education programs. And um, there is quite a lot of publications already available. This here is the mind map of a Delphi study when we asked our council, scientists from all over the world, teachers and students, what do you need to know if you want to be educated just about the word CERN? This branches to experimental and theoretical physics and so far. And we have to all these points, there is research, what you have to tell people, where you can pick them up. And this picking up, I think, is one of the, the most basic points in order to motivate them, to instill curiosity and to have an impact with education programs. Now I come to my last slide. Some very personal conclusions. So my first one is a question like, how can we educate for a sustainable future? So those of you who, um, who work in education know the acronym STEM. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This in the education community was already quite a revolution to put all of those together. And it works, in my understanding, quite well. Now, a few years ago, it was clear that we need some, to have some more creative aspect, and we added an A for arts in there. Now, what I propose is to put an E for environment in front of it, because that is what would be the goal for all those sciences to use them together to have something to educate towards. And I hope that we can have really this esteem for our planet that uh, we need in order to have a sustainable future. How can we make sure nobody is forgotten? I think the answer there is really we need partnerships all over the world. I mentioned Solvay. Some of you know the Solvay conferences maybe, but uh, here we are talking about a worldwide operating company who really put it as its goal to educate on an international level. And one question that I discussed, I think, since I arrived here was, do we need something like an International Center for Education for Sustainability? Um, like the ICTP of UNESCO, I think we need something like this. We need something to really coordinate these efforts in order not to disperse too far over all the countries we are looking at. Now, my final words, it's not personal conclusions, it's personal questions, as you have seen. And for me, questions are always an in invitation for a dialogue. And I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, as I've seen, many of you are photographing the slides anyway. This QR code brings you to the slides themselves and also my address with it. Thank you for your attention. Jonas Salk, who uh, created the polio vaccine, he was asked if he planned to patent the vaccine. He smiled and he asked in return, uh, can you patent the sun? So, sun's, uh, sun with its open science, open access policy and its focus on a sustainable future is in alignment with this uh, way of thinking and uh, these are ideals that the world uh, critically needs today. Our next panelist who will join us digitally is Dr. Susan Clark from the School of the Environment and Institution for Social and Policy Studies, Yale University. Dr. Clark, the screen is yours. We don't hear you yet. We see the... Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Do you see my slide? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, I want to thank the two preceding speakers because we're all on the same page, in many ways following the sequence. So I hope my few comments here are as much understood as an invitation for further discussion and work. I wish I were with you in person, but that's not the situation. And I'm with you in solidarity and common cause. What I want to do briefly here is offer a few comments on the concept of integrating knowledge and action, theory and practice, research and education, which from my standpoint is urgently needed. We do in fact already have strategies for integration and cooperation and co-learning. We just need to use those and include them in many of our education programs. Uh, So as I understand it, what's to be integrated here is science and education. Science lets us find the biophysical rules of reality. Education prepares us to relate the knowledge and skills of problems to the problems society is struggling with. So we must rapidly and effectively try to integrate these to help address the challenges of our deteriorating environment and uh, social situation. So to me, basic science helps us, as I said, to think about biophysical reality. But science is, uh, as we will see, uh, organized around certain epistemologies. And because the body of science knowledge is so vast, we have fragmented into many, many pieces, often called disciplines and subdisciplines. Uh, that's been very, very successful in helping the human enterprise. Uh, obviously, reductionism has uh, paid off quite well. But the question is, how do we integrate across, share knowledge across all the disciplines and positivism? So my argument here is we need a systems kind of synthesis where we put a, a lot more energy back into putting the pieces together so we can see the comprehensive whole uh, better than we would otherwise. So I think education is a process of learning about multiple ways of thinking and knowing and how to use that thought so we can act on real problems. An adequate education should provide a focal lens for inquiry, helpful concepts, good thinking, how to express yourself, and actions. Again, to help us deal with real world problems. So to be brief here, we need a configurative or integrative kind of education that is genuinely interdisciplinary, not just the word thrown around, but actually a specific method that permits us to integrate. On the right, I would argue that configurative education or interdisciplinarity requires attending to these five aspects. And I don't have time to go into all of those. So as we both know, there's many basic problems in the world. In terms of science throughout the world, we could argue there's too little. Here in the United States, science is coming under attack from a variety of political positions, and there's generally a loss of trust in science. Uh, the science we do have is often not adequately or appropriately or effectively applied to real world problems. When we think about education, uh, most education is disciplinary and specific, which is necessary, of course, but it does not produce transformative leaders who are good at real world problem solving, at least here in my world. So this brings up all kinds of questions about the relationship between disciplinary and integrative education, where we need to look at epistemologies, curriculum content, educational philosophies, and so forth. And those are all open for discussion. So in my part of the world, the context we're operating in is, uh, by world standards, fairly well educated. But there are many examples when we're not using good science or integrative or configured problem solving to uh, deal with our challenges. A couple of examples here. 
a recent report from the U.S. suggests we're going to be 125 degrees in 25 plus years, at least six weeks a year. It's quite clear America is not prepared to deal with that. Uh, we all know about ice melt in Greenland, the Antarctic, and so on and so forth, and that, what that's doing to ocean currents and sea level rises. So there are many challenges out there we need to prepare ourselves for. So on the right, I have in battle black with white lettering, you know, are people prepared to deal with these kind of challenges? Which again is the education, the configurative integrative challenge. And how are we going to transform ourselves from where we are now, where we caused those problems, to be able to deal with them effectively in the real world? As Greta points out, change is coming whether you like it or not. And some people argue a great transition is needed. And I just pointed out in the previous presentation, most education, all education is uh, contextually specific. So there are a lot of blockages to the kind of education, at least I am arguing for, this integrative interdisciplinary education. There are a lot of individual blockages. Uh, some of the lists I've seen that well over 100 ego defense mechanisms that we often use all the time uh, when our worldview is challenged to block or deflect or prevent uh, considering those. Hannah Arendt, the global philosopher of the last century, used the term thoughtless convention. And uh, that's an interesting label. Perhaps culture has built into it a kind of thoughtlessness to come to grips with the kind of challenges we're faced with and also what kind of education we need. There's also a series of blockages about, you might call it human nature, basic human character, uh, having to do with existential concerns and anxiety and adult development and many other kinds of things. And at least the education I use tries to address both kinds of blockages here. Additionally, there are other kinds of blockages in our culture. And culture is kind of like fish is to water. There's a cartoon very popular in my part of the world where someone asks the fish, how's the water? And the fish says, what's water? So most people in my experience do not understand the culture in which they live. And uh, we're going to have to learn to do that and educate it about it if we're going to come over, overcome all these blockages individually in human character and culture. So you may know of uh, Gregory Bateson. He was a great scholar of the last century. In one of his seminal books in 1972 called Steps to an Ecology of Mind, he summarized much of his work in the anthropology and psychiatry and evolution and epistemology. And what he concluded was, we are currently living in what he called a curious twist. On the one hand, we have all this knowledge, but on the other hand, we're having great difficulty using it to deal with the problems we've created for ourselves. And he talks about why that is. But in the end, at the bottom there, he talks about lack of using this knowledge is the uh, equivalent to uh, quarreling with ecology, quarreling with physics and chemistry. And we're not going to do very well if we continue trying to do that. So our society uh, is a global leader in trying to deal with a lot of these issues clearly. Uh, one of my interests of late is grand strategy and strategy. How are we going to use our resources to be most effective? That's what strategy is about. How can we accomplish large ends with modest means? And the two presentations before mine are good models for how to try to do that. This is a bit complex, but this is a uh, most scientists are educated in induction and observations. And that's what scientific positivism does. But in the right-hand column, there are some fundamental lessons from human experience that we cannot ignore. 
like it's better to try to get along than not. Uh, so how do we integrate the observations of the real biophysical social world with a lot of the wisdom that's been accumulated over the last, say, 10,000 years? So what Gregory Bateson and many other people do is say we need this central column. And we need a heuristic, a practical method to integrate what we see in the world with what we have learned from collective human experience. And what I personally do is use that heuristic. And it has been described by a lot of people and used by a lot of people in the world, but it's not widely known. And it in fact is a vehicle, a method, a way to integrate for common cause. It begins at the bottom there, as you see, as people want something, and we live and work in society and institutions, and we use and affect resources. So what is a, an appropriate relationship among those four variables? So here are the four variables, people, values, institutions, and resources. And that's what everybody in all time, and certainly the modern world, is struggling with what's the relationship among these four variables. And my argument is that the heuristic I'm alluding to, but haven't explained, is the better concept. We can use it for thinking and communicating and action. Uh, and that is essentially what I write and teach about as well as many others. This is a step down menu of these four variables that I will not go into. It's a fairly busy slide and doesn't actually explain itself. But we're looking for outcomes and effects uh, of the kind that meet the UN goals. And this is one way to approach those. So in our society, there have been many people over the decades promoting the same thing I am promoting, this integrative configurative heuristic to address problems and integrate science with human experience. Harold Laswell was president of the society at one time. Uh, and much of this heuristic came from his thinking. So Michael Reisman, as you see, was a fellow on the executive council. And uh, Winston Nagin uh, has been in, uh, involved actively in the society. So at least I'm not by myself here. So what folks like us are trying to do is start a discussion whereby maybe we could look at these integrative heuristics and see if they help us uh, integrate knowledge and action theory and practice to deal with real world problems. So I've been teaching for about 45 years, uh, students from 40 countries, and I personally worked in 15 countries. And what I'm arguing for actually works. Uh, and there's a vast literature on it. This just happened to be a group of students. There are five nationalities involved here. This is where I'm speaking from right now, this big mountainous complex in Western North America. So I see education as about transformation and development, adult development in terms of being able to deal with complexity. And these in turn are about the acquisition and reorganization of skills for application. Uh, so this is our panel here, and I want to thank everyone and again invite future conversations uh, about what I've very briefly introduced conceptually. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clark. There was one quote in, in uh, one of your slides, great transition is needed and it depends on new values. So I'm it will be very interesting to, to go on about uh, what these new values are, perhaps later in the discussion or uh, la later on we can even continue the conversation right. electronically. Now we will uh, go on. So you go ahead. Yes, uh, we, we have one more panelist. So after that, when we open it up for discussion, we can continue this. The next panelist mm -hmm. is Dr. Pu Chen from the Institute for History of Natural Sciences, Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference to invite me to, uh, for these uh, uh, talks. 
the topic of my talk is the importance of basic science, talent, and cultivation to sustainable development. Uh, as everyone knows, then China is a very famous Asian country, um, but for various uh, historical, social, and even ideological reasons, modern science didn't appear in China. It was only through commerce, war, and the consequent bring of some science and technology by a considerable number of Western missionaries, and more importantly, through the un after the victory of the revolution of 1911, and remitting efforts of an endless stream of retaining students, uh, the modern science was gradually transplanted from the west of China. As a picture, as the first one, it was found in 1928, is in uh, Shanghai, the uh, Academia Seneca. And the second picture is uh, uh, found in uh, and Peiping, and in 1929, uh, the name is National Academy of Peiping. And uh, even in uh, Yang'an, uh, the CPC um, found uh, Yang'an Academy of Natural Science. At first, uh, they want to found an academy, but the lack of uh, the faculty and the equipment, so they changed this academy to a uh, uh, just like a university. And as everyone knows, science and technology is an important factor in promoting social progress and uh, economic development. As one of the keys to the development of science and technology is the cultivation of scientific and uh, technological talents. Um, just after the founder of the PRC, and there is a very um, and lack of the high-level uh, scientists. Uh, for example, there is only 600 people specializing in scientific research, and only 30 scientific, scientific research institutions. So there are serious lack of scientific research equipment and uh, backward basic conditions. In addition, in China, only uh, 11,117 uh, 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 students uh, at the uh, university level. Uh, only, ten, uh, oh, only nearly 10,000 10, of them will study the natural science or the technology. The literacy rate of China is about 80%. 80 among which the literacy rate in rural areas is as high as over 19.5. Just after the uh, fund of the, um, the PRC, uh, the Chen Mao uh, uh, ever said, what can we make? We can make the wheat, the flour, but we can't manufacture just like a bag, a car, or a tank. So, in 1950, the premier of China, Zhou Wenlai, said, we have to build on the, the devastated mess left by the old China. And we feel that we have not too many, but too few scientists. Now, the more we come into contact with various facts, the more we feel the seriousness of this problem. With the implication of the first five-year plan of the PRC, the problem of the lack of various scientific and technology talents has become more prominent and more accurate. So China took several measures to rapidly in charge, enlarge the talent pool. First, they established of the CAS. As a common program of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which had the role of a provisional constitution, stated that the people's cultural level should be raised vigorously and the talents for national construction should be cultivated. Strive to develop the natural science to serve the construction of industry tree agriculture, and the national defense. So in spring of 1949, 
the Central Committee decided to prepare for the establishment of the uh, Natural Academy of Science. And uh, in the November uh, 1st, uh, the Chinese Academy of Science was officially, officially established. The right uh, the picture is the, uh, uh, the case outside in, from 1950 to 19. Sixty-five. A lot of um, uh, meetings and uh, is held here. And then the government uh, to determine the policy of running the case. And they said the mission of the Academy of Science is to systematically utilize the achievement of medicine science in order to serve the construction of industry, agriculture, and national defense and to organize and direct scientific research throughout the country in order to raise the level of scientific research in China. To reframe the scientific research intuition of the past in accordance, in accordance to the cultural and the educational policy still, made, still populated in the common program of the CPCC with a view to cultivating scientific construction talents so that uh, scientific research can truly save the construction of the country's uh, industry, agriculture, and so on. As the uh, policy, the three basic um, tasks of the case is first, uh, to establish the direction of scientific research. The second one is to cultivate and uh, reasonably allocate uh, scientific talents. The third one is to adjust and enrich the scientific research institution. After the founder of the case, uh, the uh, academic Seneca and the academy of Peiping, the, the scientists want to join the case. So we uh, send the telegram or the letter to the president of case, Guo Mo Ruo. On in uh, 1950, May, then May 19th of 1950, the first international meeting of the uh, case announced the establishment of the first 15 research institutes and three preparatory office for research institutes. Most of them are basic science institutes, such as physics, um, physics uh, mathematics, and uh, the uh, chemical and the others. After the, uh, after the case was founded, they still lack the high level students. So in 1955, the State Council promulgated the professional regulation of, for uh, graduate students of the uh, case. And in, in September 1955, the natural of the People's Daily Release Act as actively cultivating new strengths in scientific research, pointed out the experiment of the formal graduate system began with the case. And in 1964, the Graduate School of Chinese Academy of Science was established on a tribal basis. You know, in that time, in the University of China, the level is very low. It not, he can't fit in the need of the case. So they want to found their own university. On the 1958, they found the University of Science and Technology of China in Beijing. From the very beginning, the university quickly becomes one of the top universities in China. At that time, the Academy of Science has thus formed a trinity of research development system, merit-based academic society, and higher education function. Another method to rapidly in charge the tempo is mobilizing overseas scientists and international students to return to China. By 1950, they estimated that uh, almost uh, uh, 
5,541 Chinese students are in abroad. And half of them study on the science or technology. Under the leadership of the Ministry of Higher Education of China, the committee uh, handling the fair of uh, for, uh, foreign students returned to China was established. And they uh, read the two documents, the coronary for Chinese foreign students and welcome by certificate. On 1950, the Chinese Scientist Association issued a call to overseas students, scientists and foreign students. And the China, and after the birth of New China, various contractions have been studied, uh, studied gradually, and talents are urgently needed in every aspect. From 1950 to 1953, about 2,000 overseas scientists and foreign students returned to, the, um, to China. And uh, after 1953, nearly 1,000 scientists and uh, foreign students returned to China, one after another. And by 1957, the number of written uh, scientists has, uh, had reached up about uh, 3,000. Uh, 3, but, and, 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 and the, after the two picture is the uh, advertisement of the uh, document is on the journal or on the, on the newspaper. The left one below is the internet students. They talked about to rent in China in the America. And on the right picture, this is take, took it in Hong Kong when they went to, to China. But the uh, uh, high level uh, the scientists is, um, is, uh, is still lacked. So, uh, as everyone knows, in that time, the Chinese have a good relationship with the Soviet Union and the other uh, socialist countries in Eastern Europe. So, as a continuation and a supplement of higher education, China had to send international students to the Soviet Union and other socialist countries in Eastern Europe. In September of 1950, the first batch of international students of New China departed to study in five countries, including Poland and Bulgaria. In, by 1960, and China had sent more than 1,000 inspirations as parts, uh, 8,310 foreign students and interns to study in the Soviet Union. The majors of international students uh, covered a wide range, including yes, yes, yes. And another method to adjustment the colleagues and the departments of the universities and they are for, um, to change the um, departments and the um, through the recording of the faculties, the higher education system of New China are formed, and uh, the number of scientific and technical personnel trained by New China has rapidly increased. And Second, I will talk about the policy on um, basic science at the beginning of the PRC. And for, um, the pertinent of uh, the case, and she, pair, uh, 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 she, she said, uh, other purely theoretical scientific research uh, cannot expect the research today will be part of now. And uh, on 1953, I said to develop a basic uh, science. Uh, and uh, in uh, 1956, the Central Committee of CPC set the entire party to strive to learn scientific knowledge and to rapidly catch up with the advanced level of science in the world. 
the request the best uh, scientific force and the best uh, university graduates be contributed in scientific research. And uh, in the uh, 11, uh, year, uh, the 12 years of the visionary blueprint of uh, the for science and technology development, uh, the uh, uh, 12 key projects, one of them is the uh, basic theoretical problems in the nature science. So, uh, Last uh, to, uh, I will just uh, give samples of the achievements in sustainable development after taking these measures. First, uh, the um, high-level talents reached uh, um, two, two million, and uh, so and uh, um, the bubbling insulin was seen for the uh, first time in the world. And the theory of terrestrial phase of petroleum provides the basis for find a large amount of oil in China's onshore basins. And the five one is uh, just related uh, with the SSD goals. So I just give them fun, the example of them. And uh, the three people in China is famous than the movie star. First is Chen Jingren, and the, the second is Yuan Longping. And the third is the Nobel Prize of the to you. They, uh, all of them, was educated uh, after the fund of the PRC. So, uh, the conclusion. First, sustainable development must rely on the development of science and technology and the improvement of population quality. The second, the number and the structure of disciplines of basic science talents and training needed to be determined according to national uh, sustainable development needs. The third one is to strengthen basic science, uh, high quality scientific and technology uh, human resources is the key. The, f the four um, is for a late developing country, how to promote rapid and sustainable development of the country through the reform of science and technology system and higher education and the formulation of science and technology policies. The case of China is strong reference for other countries in the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Now we can open up the floor for questions. If any of you have any questions for any of the speakers here. Yes. for all your presentations. Uh, they were all very illuminating in many ways. Uh, my question is to... A little to closer. To Pui yeah. Chen. Uh, I said thank you to all the speakers, first of all. Um, the, I visited the Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2007. There were 95 institutes, and I thought that was a very impressive number. What is the number now? And can you tell us what is the amount of funding? Um, in addition, recently China had this uh, initiative to bring more um, uh, people from the world, world back to China, uh, that program. Can you tell us a little bit on the update on that? Uh, <coughs> after the, uh, the platform in 19. In 1956, uh, the Institute of the Chinese Academic Science is more than 100. And uh, uh, in China, we called four, uh, four road or army. And the first is the CAS. The second is the uh, university, the university. And the third is the uh, Institute of the um, Government such as the, uh, some as the, yeah yeah and the the first is the uh, institute of the some province yeah and uh, another question I didn't hear clear. Can you tell us what is the the funding? First of all, um, well, 
just tell us what is the funding for these institutes right now and uh, <coughs> the number of, and the program that China has to bring many of the scientists from worldwide countries back to China. Can you tell us what, what is the status of that? The funding. Funding. The funding. Uh, the fund money. Funding. Oh. How much money for the uh, cash? The whole. Yeah, mm -hmm. the funding is uh, from the Chinese, most of them from the Chinese government. From the Chinese government? Yeah, most of them is from the Chinese government. Uh, Professor King, uh, system was uh, on behalf of Professor Chen. As far as I know, currently, funding is from the uh, Chinese government. Sure, also, also have from uh, the National Sun, National Sun, Natural Science Foundation and the CARS also have uh, uh, its own funding to support the research institute. Uh, currently, in the research institute is 120 and the popular uh, number of scientists in CARS is uh, around 80,000 totally. So if, uh, if you really want to get uh, how much funding from the government uh, is not, uh, uh, cannot have an uh, uh, exact number, but uh, one billion, of Chinese yuan, uh, zero point one billion Chinese yuan is uh, each year. Uh, I think at least. Thank and you. also some scientists, uh, you know, working in the other countries. Uh, currently, they can work in China. Also, the uh, some countries together they travel frequently, and uh, is a high level, high level scientist uh, are paid by Chinese by by cars and with a special. Funding, so invited high-level, top-level scientists to work in in cars. I have a question for uh, Dr. Halai. So, uh, you mentioned this uh, the capacity and network project in different uh, countries. Each of these these regions will have their own uh, unique issues. Although at a fundamental level, there are some commonalities like you know, the politics, economics, the social setup. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how does ICMI or the CANP overcome them in each of these? The issues are numerous, but uh, um, to look at the solutions, how are they overcome? So I think that's the essence of the capacity and network project, that it provides uh, support uh, which is relevant to the context. So it would be very easy to provide one program, which would then be an offering from ICMAI, uh, but then whether it's relevant to each of the unique contexts or not uh, would be a question. So for example, in East Africa, one very big issue is how uh, the language of uh, instruction plays out in understanding of mathematics in the classroom, but it's also a broader question generally for the education. Now, how, does, how do we support in that? So in the network, then we have connected experts um, who then provide um, advice and solutions in that area. So my university, for example, carried out a research project in Tanzania, which was very much addressed to the issue um, of language uh, in science and mathematics classrooms. And the solution was language supported textbooks and teaching. Okay? And so uh, the connectivity is made through uh, the capacity and network project. And then very often local grassroots level support is identified to carry the work for the project because everything cannot be done by ICMAI. And neither is it the intention of ICMAI to do everything itself because that would create dependency. Right, thank you. Um, I've got one for a question for Dr. Schmeling. So this open open science and the, the the debate after the covid vaccines actually was you know re restarted at a much higher level so 
there were some who said that uh, the knowledge of the vaccine should be shared with all. And there were others who said, no, no, this is actually detrimental to the development of future science. There were both sides of the dialogue, but uh, San clearly believes in you know, open science policy. So can you tell us more about it? Because clearly that is part of uh, San's vision. Maybe this, yeah, this is yeah, better. This. Um, the uh, CERN believes on fundamental research in open science. That, that is clear. Um, CERN's goal is really the furthering of knowledge of humanity. And uh, you see with the research that we, we do as our mission, this is something which has not direct application, so to say. Um, I can well understand that those who uh, develop direct applications have an interest in keeping enough secrets in order to finance their, their, their research. This would not be the way of CERN, but CERN is, as I said, there for fundamental research. And there, I strictly believe it needs to be open and we try a lot to make it open and uh, we even make all the data now open. So uh, you can go to our da open data portal and even take the data of recent experiments and uh, redo the research yourself if you dare. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have also a question for uh, Dr. Schmelnik. Um, of the students that you bring in the lab, uh, do you track how many of these students do go into sciences afterwards? And what are the numbers? Um, we, we try to track that. We, we don't have really scientific numbers there because one of the big problems we have, and I think all of you working in social sciences have that, is to track people nowadays because of data privacy. So we are not even allowed to track them, even if they tell us we can. Now, what I can tell you of the summer camps that we have done, where we had the first two in 2017 and 18, was about 30 students each. We had this year four summer students that were at CERN for the standard CERN summer student program. and. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was more than two thirds who have taken up studies in science, technology, and engineering. So you may make a suggestion because you said you cannot track them, but if the, a forum is created uh, that the students register voluntarily, of course, and then that forum, you know, you can be member also, and then you can see how many are there and after they go into the university, then they probably say what they do now with uh, social media, actually, in some ways, this social media can be used for something that's very useful. So, if I, if I might proceed. That's a very good suggestion. In fact, we do it like this because we, otherwise we have no chance really to, to follow what those students do. Because um, in principle, even if they volunteer their information, we need to track them in a sense that we can always delete them if they change their mind. So social media, yes, helps a lot. Yes, I, we do have time, yes. But, so actually, I am for also myself uh, enticing young people. I'm from Greece and actually we had more encouragement for the women especially girls so that to go into science is that when I came to the US, 1% uh, of the, um, there were 1% of women with PhDs. The number has increased, not you know, spectacularly, like 10%, although the number of undergraduates has in, uh, increased also and faculty is increasing slowly. But uh, one, uh, maybe a very good way to entice students in science um, is to, uh, maybe to have the students that come to your labs and have spent the summer, um, if in a sense um, they become now the trainers for their peers. It's easier for um, a student to speak to another student maybe than speak to the teacher. And one way to motivate that 
is maybe if the student does that, after three years they can come again, and uh, in a sense build up the cycle for that. Um, so I don't know if you have any kind of this kind of plans. Uh, because I was, when I came to the U.S., I was in national labs. I did my master's work at Argo National Lab, um, my PhD in association with Lawrence Berkeley. But then I was a research associate at Brookhaven. And we had summer student programs. And I, then I was at IBM Research, and we had summer student programs. But they, we didn't have a means to, or, or at that time I never thought also myself, I should say, or anybody else that was responsible for the programs, to keep, in a sense, this kind of pipeline um, through the students themselves. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I, I, I smiled because we, we do that with uh, our alumni to, to take them, especially, um, as you can imagine, uh, we have students from all over the world coming to those programs, so uh, we cannot let them alone. So uh, the, uh, the kind of the, let me call them camp scouts, they, they are alumni of the programs. And you touched another point, which I think is very important, which is the, what in social science you, you call significant elder, which I just call role model. And, and this is, I think, what is needed there. And especially in order to increase the number of women, but of any group of people that is not well represented, is to have role models there. And role models who also volunteer their CV in order to show what they have done, what, what people can achieve there. And yes, you're right, we, we need young people to also uh, really do that. And uh, that's why we always try with all of our programs when we go to open science or other things, the oldest age group we send to schools is doctoral students. And already they are kind of disconnected. I mean, there is about 10 years between a doctoral student and a high school student, but still, it's the closest that you can get and we always try that. Thank you. Dr. Clark, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, I, I have a, a question for you. One of the things that you mentioned is that all the knowledge is there, but somehow there is a gap between the knowledge acquisition and the, and the implementation. And, and another quote, which perhaps is related to that, which was in your, your slide, was uh, the new values that are needed for this great transition. Can you tell us you know, briefly what uh, the, the, the values that you had in mind when you said that? What are these new values that we need for the transition? Uh, yes, I'll try quickly. Yeah. So they're not new values. It, they are a way to think about what humans currently do presently value. Like in the system I use, there are eight functional values. One being we all want to be respected. Every human being wants to be respected. We want to be treated as though we matter. So when you go about problem solving, you have to attend to that value. We also want to have well-being, physical and mental health. All humans share that. There are six other values, eight total. They're called functional values. And if you can see how different people are wanting those, at the same time you're dealing with technical problems, it's more likely you can address the challenges people face. Because the task before us, as I see it, is certainly there are many advances technologically and otherwise, scientifically, educationally. Fundamentally, we're dealing with these eight values of people. So as we make gains, how can we help people be more respected? How can we upgrade well-being? How can we upgrade knowledge? How can we upgrade skill? and the other functional values. So it's kind of a two-strand rope, so to speak, in thinking about education and problem solving. Can I make Thank a Thank you. Yes, pardon? Can I make a, an observation? Oh, yes. Once you're Briefly. done. Ah, no, you can go ahead. So I was uh, thinking about uh, the values, and when Sasha changed the acronym from STEAM to ESTEEM, I actually yes. thought, that the E would be for ethics. And I thought that if 
ethics as a value runs through everything, then environment, engagement with the environment and how we treat, we develop our young people to live yeah. in the environment would also be in a sustainable way. So that's one, one observation that I wanted to make. And the second one, I, I, I know I'll be very brief, is that uh, I think it's very heartening to note that in all the presentations uh, today, we have seen that in inclusiveness for women is an important strand that runs through. And that happens very, that, that has to start very much at the grassroots level. Role model for young girls in schools, primary schools and elementary schools are very important. Females as role models in positions of leadership. And I think that's what we work for, that even our textbooks and our teachers should represent that. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Would you like to- May I make one comment here? Yes, Dr. Clark, a brief one, yes. So, so, so my comment briefly would be that among the eight functional values, ethics is one of those. I did not mention it. Okay, okay. But ethics is uh, living a life according to the uh, uh, principal prescriptions for what a good life is, and that varies by culture. All of these functional values vary by culture in practice. The Thank overriding you. goal of all these eight functional values, according to the United Nations, is human dignity. And you're only going to get human dignity if you allow people to live in healthy environments. So I find yeah. the addition of the E to STEM, you know, a good start to uh, refocus what the overriding goal here is. And it's human dignity for all humans in healthy, biologically rich environments. And STEM is just a means to get there. My heuristic is just a means to get to the goal. So we need to think about goals and means here in terms of uh, strategy. Okay, thank you, Dr. Clark. Yeah, in, in fact, I, I put the E in front for environment because we are talking sustainability here at this conference. I was immediately, when I, when I made this, this slide, in fact, it was my last slide, which I did just last night. Um, I, was, I was thinking about what our former director general said when CERN opened from a European to a world laboratory, where the E went from European to everywhere. And I think this E for this esteem um, you can put many E's in there and it still says esteem, um, should really encompass more. And for me, the environment really means the culture, the environment in terms of nature. Uh, ethics is clearly a big part of it. We, we can discuss probably for ages what is on a higher level there. But uh, yeah, I, I agree. We need, we need to have a, a global kind of education that uh, encompasses all and that also instills curiosity for everything that we know and for everything that can further us. Thank you. Thank you all. If there are no more questions, I think we will conclude this session now. I thank all our panelists who presented highly successful scalable replicable models of science, teaching, training, research, and collaboration. And I thank everyone here for your participation.